good afternoon, John. Uh, John Scullion, we, we have here for a, a Piper's Persuasion interview. It's a special in as much as uh, we're interviewing quite a few people uh, out uh, in the world there regarding uh, shots and dikehead pipe ban, uh, winning the medley competition 1970 uh, the, the worlds and the uh, certain people are trying to replicate this performance at the World Pipe Band Championships uh, this year in August 20, 2022. And uh, towards that end, we'll speak to John Scullion, drummer extraordinaire, and uh, John's going to lead us through his part Initially, his recollection about the Shots and Dickhead performance 1970 and uh, following on from that, how he joined Shots and all the rest. John, just give us a, a wee opener here. Um, what was your impression of Shots and Dickhead in 1970? Just generally speaking, what kind of pipe band do they wear in your eyes? And what kind of drum corps do they wear? Uh, and what was your perception? How did you enjoy it? That sort of thing. And uh, whether or not you actually heard the performance that we're talking about in 1970 at the World Pipe Band Championships, a medley performance. Okay, uh, let's hear from you, John. I, um, well, when I, I heard uh, the medley, of 1970 in, uh, in a pub in Dromore. We were at a competition and uh, it was being recorded, put out by the BBC. My father was recording it and it was, it just completely blew us away. It was absolutely out of this world. It just blew us away. Mm -hmm. And my first perception was how can I play with this? Magnificent sound, the pipes, everything was just so absolutely A1. And uh, that was the lasting impression. I still feel the same way about it today, 52 years later. What part of the medley performance it, it, it gave you the most pleasure? And was it just oh, a gift? That's easy. The whole lot. Uh -huh. it, okay. it just absolutely compelling listening, the hidden mystery, and especially in, in, the, in the slow air uh, of, the, of the offbeat rules uh -huh. uh, of Alec Duther's arrangement of Loch Room Bay. But the, every bit of it was hitting the spot all the time. Yeah. The, the normal rules, the uptake to the march, the uh, 4-4 four, four march, the Hills of Alva, written by Tommy Muirhead. And uh -huh. uh, it was uh, just, it just started off with a, a, a story, a conversation. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, as it went on and on and on, there just, there just wasn't a place that wasn't absolutely hitting the spot with me. How many uh, drummers did Alec Duthard have on the field that day? Have you got any recollection about that? I and six, six on, the, or maybe seven. Sites. Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, there was Alec Duthard. There was uh, Jim Dunsmore. And the reason I'm saying Jim Dunsmore is because Alec had said that they was only going to have six drawers. Okay. So Jim, Jim went down to John McAllister, thinking that he was going to be dropped. And John McAllister told him, he says, look, you get practicing and practice hard that they can throw you out. So that's what Jim did. So Alec finished up with seven. So all their names to me, Tom Brown was a, a great influencer at that time and teacher. And uh, Tom, Tom Brown... When he, where did he play eventually? Bog Hall and Bathgate. Right. I thought that, yes. But he played with Hot Red Colliery, which became Paul Kemet later. Yeah. Uh, that time before that. And Billy Stevenson, Jim Hutton, 
Derek Barr. Uh, what are they, Colliery. They, yeah. they were a, a very famous second grade pipe band, uh, to my recollection. Yes. Uh, one time. Uh, and prize winners in second grade. I don't think they did very much in the first grade uh, if they were there at all. No, no. I think it was uh, was it Simon Reid at that time. Yeah. Uh, was the pipe major. And uh, I remember Tom Brown telling me a story about they got a sixth place or something at Cowell. And they came, to, they came back to Whitburn and they paraded every street in the place. <laughs> and every, I just thought that's what's wonderful. <laughs> I'm laughing at that. Uh, that's good. And a, so Alec does that, of course. He would compose all the drum beatings, wouldn't he? The scores for the oh. drums. Oh, yes. My right. goodness. And was there anything special about the bass section? Well, the bass section, they, they played a, a bass at that time with what I would describe as a raspy boom. Okay. Now, it didn't suit everybody, but uh, what made it very forgiven was that in, in the Lexa jig, the bass would play it in 12 years. And slow air, it would only hit every other beat, Aye. which made it more impact, you know, yeah. and less monotonous Aye. as some bands would have been. I and some bands are still monotonous with that to this day. <laughs> well, the tenor, or tenor drummers, did they have anything like that? Well, the tenor drummers didn't. Uh, they they were a they were a tapped in and out in places at strategic places and. More than they were more felt than being heard that time. Aye, you know, so it was a, a visual impact rather than a, a, a contribution oddly. Aye, oh. well, you could feel you could feel the tenors aye. doing, doing like these wee strategic bits. How but, many tenors uh, did they have anyway? Hey, how many tenors do you think they had? Well, they had three. Uh, today you're trying to uh, bring, bring this whole performance to life once uh, again. Uh, and uh, how did you get the material? Did, did, uh, who had the scores for it, etc.? Well, um, I wrote, I contacted several different channels and came up with... Uh, Gordon Brown, Tom Brown sent me three scores. That was all he had. And I contacted another fellow, a friend of Alex in America, and he, he by chance, had the same three scores. So I was still a lot of scores down. But, uh, and believe it or not, those three beatings, I knew them anyway, because I was, I was watching these guys and picking up the stuff at that time. But uh, John Dutherd, uh, he had a look through all Alex's music and uh, he couldn't come up with any of the titles. But sometimes the title of the tune maybe wasn't at the top of the page. Right, it, yeah. It, it said selected for space. Yes. And selected reels, more so than, than uh, Keel Row and Stumpy, you know. So that made it a bit difficult. But then, uh, as time wore on and I wasn't getting a lot of cooperation, I started and transcribed every beating the way it was done uh, that day. Did now, you have you... a recording? Yes, I had a recording of two years later. But I never forgot the recording in my head from, from, from the day of the World's Championship in Hazelhead Park in 1970. And uh, I was able to work out between that and what I had seen the drummers playing, I was able to work out what the transcription would be and the, the handing and the sticking because Duthard Beatons are, they're sensitive to height, they're sensitive to weight, 
And uh, if you stick to the sticking, the sound will create itself. But you have to be trusting enough to do that. Okay, so you're confident then that what you're about to play in August is more or less the authentic settings that the Alec produced on the day. Yes. That's excellent. Uh, how yeah. many drummers have you got this time? Well, we have, believe it or not, we have 10 or 11, but there is four, there's four that can't make it for uh, very good reasons. And so we will have at least six. Uh, John, where do you stay, roughly? I live in uh, a wee town land called Glasmilla. It's near Oma, County Tyrone, in Northern Ireland. I no bother. Have you always stayed there, John? No, no. I, I left. Uh, I left Scotland in two thousand and six and came back home because uh, I retired from my my work. And uh, what was your work? I was a, a a tanker driver, gasoline tanker driver for BP. I. I bet you love the prices that they're charging for fuel now, eh? <laughs> I wouldn't. That's... <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's great. And uh, see the drums that you're using. I, I, I meant to ask you, the drums that uh, you were using in the early 70s, what, who made them? Uh, what was the brand of drums then? Oh, that was, that was Premier Drums. Okay, and what are you using this year uh, at uh, the Worlds this year? I'm using Andante. Uh -huh. And what I'll, what I'll have to do is to emulate the pitch and the sound as the, as the guys are doing with the, with the chanters. Yeah. Uh, so I'll uh, not have the skins just as tight. Yeah. And I'll uh, make them a wee bit a wee bit deeper and mellow sounding. So that, that, that's the right. Do you, did you ever represent any drum company? You know, say two or three the leading drummers over the years represented drum oh, company. I, I, uh, I was uh, one of the first, if not the first, to play an Andante drum. Went about promoting them and uh, they especially... You know, apart from the sound, there was the engineering and the drum was far superior to any of the rest. And uh, so I, I had a great time for 10 years. I and, uh, Sam Hodgson, of course, was the founder of it and uh, who's no longer with us, sad to say. Uh, Where are they made, the, uh, John? Uh, what country are they made in? They're made in Northern Ireland here. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, I, what I did was uh, I watched through the years of from my dad teaching me, and he taught me to play with his mouth, not not with sticks. So when he said, "Per up, to get a blop," so then I played, "Per up, to get a blop." Now if he had a said, "Play, per up, to get a blop." I played per up, dig it a blop, because he was lying in bed with a bad back and he couldn't move his arms. So he taught me to play when I, when I was learning for serious, he taught me to play with his mouth. And that's why I, I, I play what it takes to make a sound. Some people copy a sound and they wonder why it never... They think they're playing the sound, but to the listener coming out, it's not the sound. So what you have to copy, you have to copy what guys are doing to make that sound and bring it out the way that you you so lovingly hear it. And uh, that can be a wee bit mistrusting for learners, and, and indeed I find that to be common myself. And so I developed a a concept of the Fairly Together program. And uh, so I, then I, I just named the book after that, 
I just brought out the second edition of it there. And then I brought out a separate six eight book that I was asked to by Derek Rose initiated that. Uh, 31 six eights full of exercises for six eight and good six eight rhythmic discipline, which is rare nowadays, apart from Alec Duthard's six eights uh, that were absolutely superb and still are. They're still current. And uh, so I said, What's about, the name of the books again, John? Well, a fairly together program is a second edition, is the name of the book. Who sells it? Uh, well, it's online now because printing has. I couldn't, I couldn't afford to print it. I know. Uh, and, that's, uh, that's extremely interesting. And the other point I was going to make ever so briefly is that they've when various uh, famous pipers turned up at the door of uh, R.U. Brown uh, and Nickel uh, up at Bomorrow for paper uh, tuition, he taught them orally as well. He didn't allow the practice chanter. He, he, he sang the tunes to him just the way you're talking about there just now. And they, they had to listen to him sing the tunes and copies playing from his singing of the tune. So uh, that's you've got the, the concept here in drumming as well as uh, a high level uh, piping, uh, the classical uh, beaver. So mm -hmm. there's something in common there. And that, that, I didn't know that before. And that is of great interest to everybody, I think, you know. Oh, but the modern, the modern day version of what you've just explained there, Alan, is to my mind Jimmy Wark. Yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy Wark can sing a Peabrook absolutely how it should be played. Marvelous. He, he, he couldn't play it the way that he. So there's a big advantage there to guys because it makes you it makes you open up the lungs, you know. It does. I uh, and uh, another thing it uh, is. Uh, Drumming uh, historically was an oral sort of thing, uh, and it wasn't the, the scores weren't written out, and people used to learn by ear. Uh, so how do people memorize uh, drum scores? Well, I, I, I was the same. I didn't, I would have written out wee exercises for beginners when I was. Uh, teaching at home and in the family home, but I didn't properly read or write, and I still didn't when I joined Shots. But what what made me do it was that an album came up. So when you're learning a medley or an MSR through the winter, then it's it's a very gradual process, and uh, with no no real time factor involved because. You know, until you don't need it to start and you're developing the, the, yes. the But whenever whenever an album comes up and there's 33 or 40 tunes to learn, and uh, then that changed the whole thing because uh, Alec Duthard used to call me Leslie Welch, you know, the memory guy. And uh, because I, once it went into the head, it stayed there. And it's still the case yet, but uh, where the rest of the guys left me behind, you know, oh, goodness. I used to watch some of them, uh, John Fisher, Jim Kilpatrick, Jim Donsmore, all these guys, they could read, and I couldn't. Aye. So necessity <laughs> became that I had to get to grips with it. So Bert Barr taught me a good bit as to get familiar with the, the album material used. Yeah. So, but from then on, then it was written big time and, and right. It's funny that because one of the last people I spoke to uh, in this paper's persuasion was John Walsh. Hi. Uh, John uh, seemed to have a, a, a very impressive memory also. Yes. Yeah. He, he, uh, well, John and I shared the same lodgings, and uh, we uh, 
I learned, uh, apart from the McAllisters, I learned an awful lot from John Walsh. I would say Tom McAllister, Alec Duthert, and John Walsh was the three guys that that I I I didn't know I was paying as much attention to. Shall we yeah, say. that's amazing, that isn't it? On what in So a uh, harping back before shots pipe band. Who did you play with, John? I I did a, a half season with the Lanarkshire Police. Aye, uh, that's where you meet Walsh. That's right. That's where we met Hugh McInnes and uh, as well. Aye. Uh, I used to listen to them guys playing. Uh, the tune of the day at that time was Lucy Cassidy, Hornpipe, right. and, uh, which was fantastic. And these guys could play. And uh, they, that was where Campbell McGugan and John McAllister were basically the instigators of bringing me to Scotland. After that, then, uh, there was talk of the regionalisation, as you remember, and Renfrewshire and Butte and the city of Glasgow and the Lanarkshire Constabulary uh, was all going to be amalgamated. Yeah, 1975. Yes, yeah, so, uh, so I... I went up, a, a friend of mine called me up from Northern Ireland and he asked me would I have a word with John McAllister to see if his reads was on the way or not. <laughs> I... so, so I went up to John McAllister and he, he says, and what are you doing now? I says, I don't know what's going to happen. And he says, well, get down there and see Alec Duthard. And... Uh, so I I left John McAllister's house and went straight down to Six Brady Old Crescent, New Mains, to Alec Guthard, and we sat and played and we played a bit and, and uh, that the rest is history. And that was nineteen seventy four or thereabouts, just prior yeah. to the combination yeah. you're talking about. How long did you play with shots, say, uh, John? Well, I played till uh, 19, the end of, uh, I left in 1986. You know, playing with shots was very, very natural to me, Alan, because uh, we were we were schooled on it. McAllister and Duthard were our, on, they probably didn't know it, they were our musical custodians. Yeah. And um, so everything that, we had in our head that we would love to do in pipe bands. Well, the shots had the whole, they had the whole package. How many drummers did you have in the, the 70s eh, when you were playing with shots? Well, uh, when I joined the band, I was, this, I was number seven. Okay. And mm -hmm. then uh, Bert Parr was going to pick a guy up from the airport from uh, the city of Victoria, John Fisher. And John thought that he was the seventh. Oh, wow. and, and it turned out John was the eighth. So then, uh, before that, back in the, the 70s there, the, uh, there was seven of shots in, in, in the very early 70s. And they called them the Magnificent Seven, you see. So now, now there was eight of us now, and they called us the eight wonders of the world, you know. <laughs> uh, John, uh, I never uh, looked at the back of the band uh, too closely any times I was in the, the, the band. Uh, uh, but there seemed to be something mysterious going on in the lineup of the, the snares. You had the leading drummer parked somewhere in the middle. Yes. Yeah. What was the methodology of placing various drummers around them and who was playing out the flanks and all that sort of stuff. Yes. Well, the, the customary, the customary situation was the leading drummer was the right-hand side of the band and and his sidekick, or, you know, what was known as his, the flank player who was second in command, he played out on the left. Okay. Everybody, everybody was in between them. And... 
the first time I saw a leading drummer playing in the middle uh, was from Guelph, City of Guelph Pipe Band with Ed and I, and I forget the leading drummer's name. That was the first I seen it, and I, I couldn't, you know, it was, uh, although they had a, they had a great ensemble, I have to say, and, um, but that was the first time I'd seen the leading drummer in the middle, and uh, I don't know, and, and, What's going to be strange for me now is uh, I'm going back out to the right hand side of the band <laughs> as, the shots, as the shots did, as all the bands did in 1970. Aye, aye, aye. You might find a wee bit difficulty. Uh, uh, did you, where did they play the weaker players? Was that in the middle somewhere? Well, generally in the middle. You know, there was, if you go to the back of a core, and especially if you know the drum beatings, if you go to the back of a chord, then you can figure out wee weaknesses in the sound, and then you can strategically place them guys. Yeah. To, to, to create the overall even sound, you know, the more composite, that's a more composite sound if you strategically place the players, you know. Aye. It's uh, a wee science all, all on its own, but I suppose you're, you're learning from mistakes as well over the years, don't you? Yes, yeah. Uh, was there any outstanding uh, performance that you ever took part in? You thought, well, that's mind blowing or whatever, you know, uh, a, a real memorable performance at any time. Oh, goodness. Oh, uh, well, if Alec, like, there was. Literally, ten of that could have been fifty or right. hundred with Alec Duthard. There was some absolutely, you know, and I wondered how it was ever going to get any better. You know, it, it was like it was like hearing a, a pipe band, and you're saying, "Look, this pipe band, this all, nothing can ever beat that." And lo and behold, later on, somebody does. Right. That all the performances we are like, I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed. And uh, I probably enjoyed them more than he did at times because uh, the memory would have, uh, the memory, he would maybe have forgotten little bits, you see, in the performance. And then he would look down the line and we would be going like this here. <laughs> But the rule was that if that happened, that we would all come in with the correct double 40 part. Aye, aye. And that goes away. And maybe you should explain a wee bit about that a concept to uh, the viewers from Piper's Persuasion are not au fait with the piano and double 40, all that sort of stuff. Yes, well, the piano and double 40 was... The piano was the leading drummer's part, and indeed, in 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 Alec Duthard's case, uh, it started off there was uh, no unison in Donald Cameron, so that that means that the drummers would come in and out the first time over the part, you know. And then, that's the first eight bars. The first time you play the eight bars. That's right. These uh, eight bars had to be repeated in that way. Uh, completed yes. part one out of maybe four-party tune or a six-party tune even. Yes, exactly. And then, uh, so, there would be little passages of unison that would help uh, accent the, 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 the tune's direction or, or the beaten's direction of the melody. And uh, then, over the years, them passages got shorter but a lot more often, till nowadays, you don't know that the double 40 should have been the loudest part. And nowadays, you don't know, if you didn't know the piano double 40 regime, you wouldn't know whether it was piano double 40 or not, because this, this, the whole thing's clouded with too much unison. The leading drummer is playing least on his own nowadays than he ever did before. And uh, 
the so and indeed in double forty. There's still there's there's in reels and things like that now. There's there even the the snare players is the leading drummer still doing a couple of bars now at the end of some double forty parts. You know. I, so you think is there a, a chance that the whole th- uh, things becoming too clever now, or what? Well, it's not, not, not too clever. I wouldn't say too clever, but I would say that there, there's less variety of rudiments. Aye. Yeah. There's less definitive drumming. There's less uh, roll top separation because uh, at accented rolls, whereby the accent isn't the loudest, and by word and deed, that should be the case, but it doesn't happen. And uh, on downbeats or strong beats, sometimes that's when the drums are most quiet. And if you if you listen to this conversation now, and you'll see that from different points there, my accent is by duration and pitch, like a newsreader. And if I was to talk the way a lot of drummers play today, I would be saying, Alan, I am here t- talking to you this day. <laughs> you know? oh, it's, yeah. the, it's the, the Jack and Jill went up the hill and Ba Ba Black Sheep. Now, against, I wandered lonely as a cloud. You see? Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's a, a different thing. So they're, they're not telling a story, they're not phrasing, they're not uh, uh, pointing and cutting. Everyone's a straight through uh, even a uh, sort of performance of notes. Is that uh, an summation? Well, so we bet the difference now is that people would remember Duthard Beatons for what it did to the tune, to the melody. Yeah. Nowadays, nowadays the bands, the, the, there's never been as many good players and great players as there is now. Uh, but that's through better teaching as well. But uh, if you listen to a band, there's not a bit of drumming that you could pick out among it because it's all like the same. Aye. You know, Aye. So, so you wouldn't remember. I, if I was listening to a band now, I, I couldn't pick out a part, oh, I like that wee bit there, that was brilliant, and this, that, and all. You couldn't pick that out now because it's it's in a phase whereby it's lending itself to the melody, but it's not directing it in any way. Some people would see that as a good thing. The, the, a, as a, on a personal a, observation of your own, uh, how, if you're standing, uh, listening to first grade now, uh, just outside the field, wherever, the arena, uh, do, you, do you find it attractive? Do you find it boring? Or do you find it uh, invigorating? Now, what, what's emotion do you have when you're listening to fight bands in first grade now? Well, I've... I've went about for a good few years now and I watch and listen and then I watch when the crowd's talking and that tells you an awful lot. So you have a great opening tune and then you, maybe a couple of jigs, everything's great. And then you hit the slow air and then about three or four bars of the slower, then people start talking. Right? And then where, where the worst bit is for me is after a, a beautiful melodic, melodic slow air with appropriate seconds, a very beneficial, and then they break into a suspe. And the suspe is a low note downtrodden stress pay and everybody switches off they're talking yeah they're talking all the time you've heard this many a time yourself oh, I and then then they, they start into a reel 
And then about the second part of the reel, oh, there's not a mute because they love it again. And then they finish off with a, a hornpipe and it, it makes all the sins before that easily forgiven. I am. Um, so if you get a good finisher, then folks start clapping at the end and all that. Sort yes, of stuff. that's but yeah. the middle part, part of the performance. It takes quite a dip in your view uh, from a listener's perspective. Eh? Yeah. Aye. Uh, the, uh, okay. but there's many, many happy suspects and, and, and like all these tunes and reels and everything else and marches. Well, a, a march can be a medley thing or an MSR. And a reel can be an MSR thing or a medley thing. Yeah. But a strospe is always a strospe. And you, you well, like it played up, don't you? Well, so, it, has, it has to be happy. I think too many pipers now in general that the critique used to separate bands now, like uh, Strong Week, Medium Week. Now, Strong Week, Medium Week does not work, Alan. It no. does not work. It's the old textbook. Always think of threes. If you do two bars of suspect, you only only, hit, only think of seven notes. Tom McAllister would have went down maybe a rhythm with his heel, where he would, instead of going... One, two, three, four. He would have went. See? I, I, and that left and it gave it, it made it a happy suspect. And no over punctuation. Uh, pipers now are afraid of the, of the critique that they'll get. If they play a happy, uplifting strospe. It's got to be a flowing tune as well. Yes, absolutely. And well, the, how would the Highland dancer respond well, that's to Well, good point. Excellent point. That when the dancer jumps up, you can't say, oh, stay there now till I'm ready with a knee throat break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I just say, Alan, that in defense of judges, whenever you read a sheet from a judge, then the proper way to look at it is that whether you agree or disagree, you may totally disagree with the sheet. But the question that everybody has to ask themselves is, what did I do that made him write that? Uh-huh. It's, it's not about who's right or wrong, you know what I mean? Aye. But the too few people uh, actually ask that question, and there's too few pipe majors and other bandsmen go and listen to other performances in the first grade. Yes. You know, and then they stand there at the line uh, waiting for the results to come out, and they don't understand why they never get first. They should uh, start listening to other performances and they might be learning something about what they should be doing for next time out. You just, uh, men you just mentioned a point there. I say that at the start of, of every, uh, from the starting line of competition, the arena, and the pipe major's out and he's going like this and he's going like this. Now, you don't see an orchestra conductor doing all this before. Now, if them guys don't know the tempo that that's supposed to be, then they shouldn't be there. Aye. This, click, this click track, they know the way to play. They yeah. know the tempos. They should even be, by the right, quick, march, go. Well, but that's for a year, so they should know the tempos by that time, as you say. <laughs> The same in solo drumming. They start Aye. all dancing about, and then when they don't play it at the speed that was that was predicted, then the judge will hammer them. So I don't the judge know what time you're going to play at. I, I, as a, a, a piper I know, a good good player, said 
don't start over uh, examining the tune on the day because it's too late. You can't practice it on the day. Just go and play the tune. Absolutely. Just go and have fun. Dead, right? If it's a mess, it's a mess. But there's nothing you can do about it that Saturday. It's too late. It was too late a Friday. It was too late a week oh. last Friday. You know. Yeah. So you've had the, the winter week. at it and that's it. The week before the Worlds, uh, in my experience, every band works far too hard. The work should have yeah. been done the three weeks prior to that week. Yeah. Then give them all a lollipop that week. And then you come to the Worlds. <laughs> John, they're too, bu they're too, too busy parachuting players in from other and countries. And then, uh, that one, one, thing, one thing that uh, Shorts used to do, and that it was right. Aye. It's a gamble if you haven't got good men. But the first time that you play that medley or MSR as a band that day, there's a sparkle in it that never comes back. You're right. That's the one you keep for the circle. Don't play it before you go on. I don't know many times I've told a certain crowd that same thing, and they go and play for an hour and a half before they go into the competition. They're on their hands and knees. They've got no energy. They're dehydrated. They've lost every concept of what they should be playing. And the best time they played was when they come off the bus, tuned up the drones and played the set. They lose the appetite for good playing. Of course they do. Before the before their performance. Aye. Uh, we've been there, seen it, done it. Yeah. Yeah. John, we we'll look forward to uh, seeing you. And uh, John, I'm going to pull a plug on it. And thanks very much for my uh, paper's persuasion. No and I uh, hope that we've got a recording because if we've not, we'll need to get through all this again. Well, that, <laughs> I, if I listen to myself all that again. <laughs> John, all the best to you. Yes, Al. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.